This is the second part of the carbon cycle. And this is where we look at carbon sources and sinks. Carbon dioxide can get stored in places. This is called a sink. When a tree makes wood, that is a sink for carbon dioxide. It becomes trapped in cellulose. Seashells are formed from calcium carbonate, which is very similar to our bones. They build this mineral with the CO2 from the air. Seashells, chalk, and limestone all represent a carbon sink. Another way of calling this is instead of a sink, we call it sequestered carbon. When you sequester a jury, you lock the people in a room until they make their decision. If you burn wood, eat strawberries, dump acid on limestone, or thaw an Arctic swamp, you will release the stored CO2. Acid on limestone, you did this as a chemistry experiment as a child. Baking soda and vinegar is basically the same effect. So these three things have stored away an awful lot of carbon dioxide um, in the Earth's history. Because our atmosphere was once primarily carbon dioxide. The entire Niagara Escarpment in the Orangeville area, stretching from Niagara Falls to Tobermory with us in the middle, and the limestone cliffs uh, and chalk of the White Cliffs of Dover, are all ancient CO2 that seashells built into rock. When I write with chalk on the blackboard, I'm pretty much using fossilized dinosaur breath to do that. Now, what disruptions do we do to the carbon cycle? We burn fossil fuels in great quantity, which releases massive amounts of CO2, far more and far faster than the plants can absorb, and then we go out of our way to destroy most of the plant life on Earth. And we are poisoning the oceans, which takes out the majority of the plant life. Yes, the Amazon looks really cool and interesting, but 70% of the surface of the Earth is water. So there is a gigantic plant reservoir in the ocean that tiny little green things that you need a microscope to see. What are the consequences of this disruption? The carbon cycle is no longer balanced. Carbon dioxide is now produced at a rate faster than the plants can absorb. This is called it caused a doubling of CO2 levels in the last 300 years and is triggering global warming. Many will claim that the CO2 will encourage more plants to grow and then the levels will fall again. This is false for two reasons. The scale of our emissions is hard to imagine. If you are on the Titanic as it sank, do you think a mop could help? Also, we aren't planting more life, we're taking it away as fast as we can. And scary is still, most oxygen comes from the ocean plants, and they are not tolerant of high heat levels and are dying off. So we're seeing a die off in the ocean, which is making most of our oxygen, and it will start producing CO2. Now, what about oxygen throughout the ages? G is giga, billion. We're able to track what the oxygen was like throughout the uh, history of Earth. And for most of the history, the oxygen was nearly zero. Okay, this is 20% today. 0.2 is 20%. And all the way up to a billion years ago, you would have suffocated on Earth. There was no oxygen. Then all of a sudden, around a billion years ago, what they call the Great Oxygenation Event, green plants formed, and the oxygen level spiked at 35%. And this is why we had giant insects back then. Uh, a 14-inch wide dragonfly couldn't breathe fast enough in today's atmosphere to survive. And this killed almost all the life prior to it. Oxygen is highly poisonous. And then the oxygen levels fell to our modern time. So once upon a time, Earth actually had more oxygen. 35% uh, oxygen, you wouldn't want to start a uh, fire. It'd be uncontrolled forest fires if you uh, did that. Um, and we wouldn't handle it too well. 35% oxygen would get irritating on your eyes and lungs after a while. Now, how do we know about this burst in oxygen? Part of it is this. And this is, again, part how I want you to see the world a bit differently. This banded iron formation, this red rock here, is means the iron in this rock was exposed to oxygen and rusted. So we find these layers where all of a sudden the rock turns red, meaning there was an awful lot of oxygen present. And at times we literally find 
um, an ice core or a piece of amber or something, and we can directly sample the atmosphere from back then. But this is a lot of the evidence of the high uh, oxygen content in the past. Now, before the great oxygenation event, this is pretty much what Earth would have looked like. These stromatolites uh, are cyanobacteria, and they're the kind of bacteria that don't really like oxygen, and they have to grow in swampy, low oxygen environments. And they once covered the Earth, and now they're only in a few specific spots. Uh, so the presence of oxygen allowed Earth to move past this kind of life form to the variety we see today. Carbon is in almost anything that's organic. I think it, I pretty much say 100%. Carbon is pencil lead, coal, or diamond as a non living material. But in the body, you find carbon in sugars, starches, meat, bone, skin. It's pretty much why any food item burns black. But magnesium, when it burns, forms magnesium oxide. No carbon dioxide, no carbon is in magnesium. So when you burn magnesium metal, you're left with this white ash. So if something burns and leaves you this characteristic black material, it's almost 100% that's carbon. And then you can look, if you want, at these slides that go into the detail of what a lot of carbon compounds look like, particularly if you've taken health or any kind of diet stuff before you've seen it. Carbon is just, life is full of carbon. And here is meat and chlorophyll. Notice carbon galore in life. And the main difference between chlorophyll and the hemoglobin in your red blood cells is simply switching out the iron for magnesium and suddenly goes from red to green. Neat stuff. This would be all grade 11, 12 um, kind of things. And you could read about the uh, carbon sources and sinks here if you like and other cycles. But again, blue colored slides, totally optional. Okay, so there ends the carbon cycle.